Um, a few weeks back we asked people for their ideas of what they'd like us to do over winter while we're stuck in marinas and things and one of the things that has come up is anchoring and mooring. So we've decided to tackle that subject today. Yeah. Now the way we're going to do this is, it could be a very very dry talk to camera, so what we're going to do is we're going to illustrate it with things that happened to us while we were out and about on our cruising this year mostly. So we're going to be jumping from today, which is early December, back into the summer when it was nice and sunny and we were having a great time. Yeah, sounds like a plan. And we mess things up. All the time. <laughs> but if we're learning from our mistakes, then you can learn from those mistakes, but you can also learn from our triumphs. Let's start with moorings. Yep. And the first question we've got to answer is... How do we talk? How do we what? Talk! No, 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 no. You're, you're off the script. The script is what's wrong with marinas. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so what's wrong with marinas? I mean, you've got a perfectly good marina. Why would you want to go to the trouble of trying to find a mooring ball somewhere out there? Or... Anchor. Anchor somewhere out there. Well, for me, the top reasons are the marina may not be where you want it. Um, also, um, some of the uh, remote islands and things like that, they don't even have a marina. Or a harbour, some of them. No, they don't. Or for our boat, yeah. um, the harbours are just inaccessible. We have a draft of 1.7 metres, um, but many harbours are dry out. So th for us, they're just not suitable. So one of the reasons you might not stay in a marina is it may not be there. That's a pretty good, mar <laughs> pretty good reason not to be there. Assuming there is a marina nearby, it may be expensive. Mm. I mean, a marina for one night in the Scottish Islands was generally somewhere between 30 and 35 quid. Um, 38 pounds was the most that we paid for a marina um, because it was 35 for the um, marina, but then you had to pay electric as well. If you plugged into the electric, you played for that. Um, and the thing is, for one day that's fine, but if you're going to be there for a week, that's like two, 250 pounds. That's a fair bit of money out of your cruising kitty. When you're going to pick up a mooring, uh, there is a major problem, thanks to the design of most boats. And that is the fact that the mooring ball tends to be the front of the boat. And the person doing the steering tends to be at the back and in between is a large boat with a high freeboard and you lose sight of the mooring as you get closer to it. Um, also there's no way that you can hear what the person, if they're shouting instructions there's just no way that you can hear that at the back. Unless they turn around to face you and shout. Which um, means that they're not looking where they're supposed to be. Go, yeah and you may have the engine, well you will have the engine you going. You will have the engine going. So that's noise at this end. Yeah so. So we need to communicate. Now Beverly and I have used um, various ways in which to communicate. Now the first is actually just our mobile phones. Um, now this works really well because I can have um, or Beverly can have the phone on hands-free and then the other person can have their phone on hands-free and they can just talk ordinary. But where it really fails is when you're starting to go into some of the remote places where, let's be honest, which is where you want to moor or anchor um, and there is no phone signal. So what did we try next for areas that have no signal? <sighs> oh, a little walkie-talkie. And um, you can pick these up for £10. Um, these work really well, but the problem is um, when you uh, are talking to the other person, you've actually got to press the button to talk to them. That can be... Uh, yeah, if you've got your hands full. You know, your hands are full and you've got a boat hook in one hand, you've got a walkie-talkie in the other hand, you're trying to talk to somebody. And you've got to be disciplined because there's been more than once the batteries have run out. Yes. <laughs> so that's another problem. Yeah. But... Um, in the end, uh, this didn't really work for us. Okay, so that's enough from a cool December in Northern Ireland. Let's skip back into the middle of summer in the Menai Strait in Wales. And here's what we had to say then about our current method of guiding each other to a mooring ball. What we've done is we've adapted um, signals from my time in flying. If you've ever seen a movie or something like that of people marshalling 
aircraft around in airports. There's a guy with either two paddles or two lighted sticks, depending whether it's daytime or night, and he makes certain movements. Like if he wants an aircraft to come towards them, he does this. If he wants an aircraft to go one side, he, he will do this sort of thing, where he will do that, and indicate to the aircraft, go that way, go that way, go that way. If he wants it to stop, he'll put his hands above his head and, and cross them, like that. Uh, you know, there are various, there's actually a lot of signals, there's about 20 or 30 of them. We only need three or four. Basically, you follow my finger. If I point that way, you take the boat that way. If I point that way, you take the boat that way. If I point that way, the boat goes forward. And the faster I point, the faster you move the boat. The slower I point, the slower I move the boat. That's it. The person on the back has to utterly trust the person on the front. That's the way it works. <laughs>
we assume it's not well maintained under the water where we can't see and we'll generally drop a buoy like that and leave it won't we yes so that's one thing you just got to be careful also if a mirroring ball parts your boat is going to be moving pretty quickly straight away so don't pick one with a lee shore behind it not fair yeah. enough yeah uh, the other issue that you can have with mooring balls is just like anywhere else make sure that you've got enough depth for your boat oh yes um, <laughs> if there's a uh, large waves coming in then you need to think about the depth of um, where you are in the water and the depth of the height height wave height yeah we've been on a mooring um, in Scotland where our height was going up and down by about a metre, a metre and a half and we didn't have a lot of water under us at the time. No we didn't. And there was danger of hitting the bottom. Yeah. Um, the only other issue that you can have with the mooring boy is um, a lot of the ones in Scotland have got tonnage weights on them, um, like 15 tonnes, but sometimes when you're picking up a mooring um, it doesn't say what the uh, mm. weight of the boat is so you do have to be careful uh, with that right one other thing and this applies to anchoring as much as mooring but it goes back to the problem of communication again mm. um, which is the person at the back cannot see what's going on up at the front mm. uh, so when you're coming toward a mooring ball the person at the front has to guide the boat to it and that means that the responsibility for any mess ups are on the person at the front because you're the one telling the helmer where to go and the helmer will do what you tell them if the helmer's doing their job correctly. Um, so we've had times where, I quite freely admit it, I didn't pay attention to what I was doing and I put the boat between the pickup boy and the mooring ball which means there's rope stretched under the boat which is not good. Now. We were able to bring the boat to halt very, very quickly and grab the boy and get it out of the water. But that was inattention on my part and I shouldn't have done it. Mm. So when you are approaching these things, look at the pickup boy um, because it will indicate to you the direction the tide is flowing and approach with the pickup boy between you and the mooring. Yeah. And you can see in this example, I didn't do that. <laughs> uh, another little consideration, something we discovered on Salty Lass is you need to be able to stem the tide like for instance um, we were coming up uh, to a mooring in Menai and it didn't have um, a pickup boy um, it had the ring mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so what that meant is I should have been stemming the tide because uh, what happened was we actually broke Mr Swifty, didn't we, Bev? What actually happened there was we actually approached the boy from the wrong side. We were tired and we made a mistake. Yes. We approached with the tide running from behind us and as soon as we got near the mooring ball and I, I tied onto it, we just kept getting pushed past it. Yeah. We should have turned 180 degrees should and come always, from the other side. You should always, um, as I say, with mooring boys... Approach into the tide. Approach into the tide. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, if you do have any other comments um, or topics that you want us to cover, then do put them in the comments below uh, because um, we want to talk about things which um, you want to watch. So we'll leave you with that and uh, we hope to produce um, another one of these on anchoring in the near future. Yeah, I'd like to actually go out and anchor it <laughs> to help with that. We've done plenty of anchoring. Yeah. You just look for your excuse to go out the sale. Of course I am! <laughs>